This study in the New Testament book of John is offered for the edification of all students of God's Word by spiritandtruth.org. Pastor Andy Woods of Sugarland Bible Church will be our instructor during this study. It is our prayer that this study will deepen your understanding of the Bible and allow you to draw closer in your relationship with God through His Son, Jesus Christ. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. John 17.3 Now let's begin our time of study in this important and fascinating book of the Bible. Well, good morning. If uh, we could take our Bibles and open them to John's Gospel, chapter 1 and verse 43. I'm going to try to look at this morning John chapter 1, verses 43 through 51. The title of our message this morning is A Stairway to Heaven. I know I've been listening to too much uh, Led Zeppelin, whoever came up with that title. A Stairway to Heaven. We are in the midst of a Bible study going through John's Gospel. John's Gospel is about the light and the life revealed in the person of Jesus Christ We spent our first couple of sessions sort of dealing with the background of the book of John, who wrote it, and who was the author, when was it written, those types of issues. But really, if you want to understand John's gospel, what you need to hone in on are verses 30 and 31 of chapter 20, because there John does a very nice thing for us as readers. He tells us why he wrote his book. It says, therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these have been written so that you might believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life uh, in his name. Everything John does in this book will be to unfold the proper identity of Jesus Christ with the hope and the very strong exhortation that the reader would believe in Jesus Christ and consequently receive the gift of life. The first major section of the book, of the five major parts, is a heavenly genealogy linking Jesus back to heaven, which is what a genealogy does. It reveals the origin of someone. And it's there we learn that Jesus came from heaven and he went back to heaven after his ascension. And then from there we moved into and we are moving into the largest section of John's gospel, which is his public ministry. And the whole section revolves around seven signs and seven discourses of Christ. But the section that we are in is sort of a precursor to the seven signs. And this is a section that I like to call the presentation of the Son of God. Jesus is presented, first of all, to, excuse me, by John the Baptist. Then he is presented to John the Baptist. Last time we were together, we saw that Christ was presented to Peter and Andrew. And now the section we look at this morning is the presentation of Jesus Christ to Philip and Nathaniel. The first three parts there in that outline, really verses 19 through 42, take place in a location called Bethany beyond the Jordan, where John the Baptist was baptizing. And now the scenery shifts... By the way, if you're interested, it says in verse 28 where the first three parts occurred, Bethany beyond the Jordan, 
But then as you drop down to verses 43 through 51, the location changes up north to a place called Galilee. There in verse 43, you'll see a reference to Galilee. And it's here that Christ is going to reveal himself to his next two men who would eventually become his disciples, his followers. And they are, number one, a man named Philip. And number two, a man named Nathaniel. Now, here's how we can outline uh, the section that we're looking at this morning. Number one, we have Philip coming into faith. Verses 43 and 44. Number two, we have an an invitation to a man named Nathaniel. Verses 45 and 46. And then we have a what I believe is really a first miracle of sorts. It's a precursor to the other miracles that are coming. But we have a miracle performed specifically for Nathaniel. And this spurs Nathaniel to believe in Jesus Christ. And then finally, verses 50 and 51, the chapter wraps up with a promise to Nathaniel by Christ of greater things to come in terms of signs, greater things on the horizon. But notice, if you will, this first section, Philip begins to believe. And notice what it says there in verse 43, the first part of the verse. It says, the next day he purposed to go into Galilee. Now, this expression, the next day, as we've tried to argue is a structural marker. It basically shows us how to outline or to divide up this chapter. So the day before was the initial faith of Peter and Andrew, and the day before that was John the Baptist identifying Jesus Christ for who he is. And now we're on to a completely different day. The day following these events is the conversion, if you will, or the faith of uh, a man named Philip. And as you continue on in verse 43, it says, The next day he purposed to go to Galilee. Now, Galilee, as we've mentioned, is is up north. Uh, If you'll keep reading there into verse 43, um, it says he purposed to go into Galilee, and he found Philip. And Jesus said to him, follow me. These events, more specifically, are taking place at a location called Bethsaida. Galilee up north and Bethsaida. And you'll notice what the text says. It says he purposed to go into Galilee. And I realize that some of our Bible translations will capitalize he, making it look like Jesus is the one that made that decision to go up into that area. But when you get actually into the Greek text, you'll discover that the issue is really not that clear. There's a debate amongst scholars and commentators. Was it Philip? Or was it uh, Peter? Was it Andrew? Uh, Or was it Jesus Christ that originally wanted to go up into that area? I am sort of of the opinion that it was Andrew and not Christ that made that move spurring Jesus on up north. And some reasons for that are, number one, everyone else in this chapter comes to faith through a personal invitation of somebody else besides Christ. So why would this chapter be the one exception? As you drop down to verse 44, it says, Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. So it makes sense that Andrew would initiate this movement into Bethsaida since Andrew himself is from this area called Bethsaida. And this, quite frankly, is consistent with everything that we know about Andrew. Andrew is the one who is always bringing other people to Jesus Christ. He wants others to know and to see the things that he has seen. We see that in John 1, verses 40 and 42, as he brought Peter to Christ. 
There's other references to Andrew doing this in chapter 6, verses 8 and 9. Down in chapter 12, verses 20 through 22. But whoever initiated this, whether it be uh, Andrew, whether it be Jesus Christ, it's not completely clear. Somehow Christ moves up into that northern area in the Galilee area to a city called Bethsaida. And this is where he encounters a man named Philip. And notice what Jesus says to Philip in verse 43. The next day, he purposed to go into Galilee, and he found Philip. And Jesus said to him, follow me. Now, I would uh, encourage you not to read too much into those words, follow me. I think if you just take the words, follow me, literally, what it is saying is Jesus is walking And he is asking Philip to follow him in proximity. There are many references in this chapter to Jesus inviting people to follow him. For example, if you go down to about verses uh, 37 and 38, actually verse 36, it says he looked at Jesus as he walked. Uh, Verse 37, the two disciples heard him speak and they followed him. Uh, Verse 38, and Jesus turned and saw them following. So the idea of following here is this idea that they are to walk after Jesus Christ. And really the issue is about as simple as that. Now, why make an issue of that? There is a doctrine in the church today called Lordship Salvation. Here is a quote from my learned professor, Robert Leitner. We used to call him uh, Lightning Bob, but that was his nickname. He wrote a book called Sin, Savior, the, uh, Sin, Savior, Salvation, which is a very fine book. And in this book, he gives a critique of a doctrine called Lordship Salvation. And here's what Lordship Salvation teaches according to the words of Dr. Leitner. Lordship Salvation refers to the belief which says the sinner who wants to be saved, must not only trust Christ as his substitute for sin, but also must surrender every area of his life to the complete control of Jesus Christ. Now, that synopsis of Lordship Salvation should raise your spiritual antenna. Because as you look at Dr. Leitner's synopsis of the doctrine of lordship salvation, which he spends a chapter in this book criticizing and critiquing, you'll notice that there is not one step to salvation. There are two. That would contradict everything that we know about John's gospel. The word believe is used about a hundred times to show people specifically how they enter into a relationship with Jesus Christ. The Protestant reformers called this sola fide, which simply means faith by itself. But Lordship Salvation says faith by itself is not enough. There must be an additional step. You must uh, commit. You must yield. You must surrender. And as we look at Philip, as he has now come into faith, all you have to do is read the rest of the gospel and you will see that Philip is not yielded to Christ in every area. For example, in John 6, verses 5 through 7, this is what it says. Therefore, Jesus, lifting up his eyes and seeing that a large crowd was coming after him, said to Philip, now this is the man that we're reading about here, said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread so that these may eat? This he was saying to test him, for he himself knew that he was knew what he was intending to do. In other words, Christ is going to perform a miracle. But look at Philip's lack of faith. Philip, John six verses five through seven, answered him, Two hundred denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them for everyone to receive a little. In other words, Jesus is going to perform a miracle, but he doesn't tell Philip, I'm going to perform a miracle. He is looking at Philip to see if Philip has the faith to believe that Jesus can perform a miracle. And Philip has no miracle in his mind. He just does a head count. Translation, 
Philip flunked the test. Here was a man that was in Christ, but was doubting. The story of Philip goes on. In John 14, verses 8 and 9, it says this, Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long, and yet you do not know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Philip had been with Christ throughout most of his three-year ministry by that time. And yet Philip did not understand rudimentary theology. He did not understand basic Trinitarianism. And Jesus corrects him for that. So since Philip is in faith, and Philip is struggling with many issues throughout John's Gospel, we can very clearly conclude that submission or yielding every area of one's life to Jesus Christ is not the prerequisite for salvation. What is the prerequisite for salvation? It is simply one word. It is to believe. And it is to trust. You say, well, are you down then on people yielding or surrendering all of the areas of their life to Christ? I'm not down on that at all. And the reason I'm not down on that is because we understand the three tenses of salvation. Your salvation is accomplished in three parts. First of all, there is something called justification. That is when we are delivered from the past penalty of sin at the point of faith. And there is only one condition which must be met for a person to be justified before a holy God. And that condition is faith by itself. Not faith plus yielding plus commitment plus surrender. It is faith alone. John will tell us that a hundred times. The New Testament will tell us that 250 times. But after a person becomes a Christian, now God moves them into the second phase of their salvation where they are gradually being delivered from sin's power as they learn to yield to the divine resources which are within them. That's where you put all of the terminology in that second phase related to lordship. Commitment, yield, surrender, repent. All of that stuff goes into part two, not part one. And if you put all of that stuff into part one, instead of part two, you just taught a two-step approach to Christ, which is unbiblical. And then finally the day will come when we will experience the future tense of our salvation, which is something called glorification, where we will be out of these bodies and we will be in the presence of the Lord without even a capacity for sin at all. Lordship, yielding, commitment, repentance, These are not things a person does to enter into a relationship with God. The moment we teach those things as conditions for entering into a relationship with God is the moment we have added an additional work to salvation. There is only one condition that must be met. If nothing else, build your theology on John chapter 3 and verse 16, a verse that we all know very well which says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. A hundred times the word believe is used in this Gospel. 250 times, roughly, in the New Testament, the word believe is used. So we keep the Gospel, in terms of justification, as simple as the Bible makes it. But then, so people don't think that we're down on commitment and yield and surrender, people move into the second phase of their salvation where they're learning now to walk with God under the power and the resources of the Holy Spirit. They are learning to access the divine resources which are in them. And that's where we begin to talk about yielding, commitment, surrender. The lost sinner has no ability They have no capacity to yield or commit or surrender because they don't have the Holy Spirit inside of them to help them or to empower them. 
you're asking them to do something they can't do. And yet, the believer, though, with the divine resources, with the power of the Spirit inside of them, we discover they have this ability to yield, to commit, to surrender, and things of that nature, because something greater than them has now entered them. And so when Jesus says to Philip, follow me, try not to load that terminology with all sorts of theological jargon. It's just a simple expression to walk after me. What is happening to Philip? What is happening to Peter? What is happening to Andrew at this point in their lives as they are coming into initial faith? And yet, as the biblical record unfolds, once they are in faith, Jesus will call them into service. He will tell them at a much later date, I want to make you fishers of men. Becoming a fisher of men is not a prerequisite to be justified before God. It instead is a prerequisite to sanctification, growth, and development. So Philip is, at this point in the game, believing on Jesus Christ. Now, we move into the second part of this, where we have now an invitation to Nathanael. And notice what it says there in verses 45 and 46. Philip found Nathanael. Now, what we need to see here are the principles of what we call spiritual multiplication. John the Baptist shared Jesus Christ or pointed Jesus Christ out to Andrew. Verses 36 and 37. Andrew points out Jesus Christ to Philip. Verse 43. Andrew is the one, I believe, who initiated the move up north into Galilee. And now that Philip is in faith, he is now leading Nathaniel into faith as well. Verse 45. So it goes from John to Andrew to Philip or to Nathaniel. And this is what we call the principles of spiritual multiplication. I am very much a product of Campus Crusade for Christ. In fact, the college uh, that I went to, the headquarters of Campus Crusade for Christ, was very near to where the college was that I was attending. And I had many, many opportunities to listen to Dr. Bill Bright, the founder of Campus Crusade for Christ, articulate the principles of spiritual multiplication. And the principle of spiritual multiplication is simply this. If you were to this year, or over the course of a year, lead two people to Jesus Christ, and then you were to disciple those two people, and then the next year, those individuals that you led to Christ, along with yourself, led two more people to Christ, and you discipled those people. And then the next year, the process repeated. And then the next year, the process repeated. Within about, Dr. Bright said, 30 to 32 years, you would run out of people to convert. I mean, we would literally be fighting over converts. I saw them first. I'm going to share the gospel with them first. No, I saw them first. And so this is what is happening, is the word of Jesus Christ is being is coming forward and it's being multiplied into the lives of these men and they are telling others and the word about Jesus Christ is multiplying. One of the professors that played a great role in my life during my time at Dallas Seminary was a man named Dr. Pentecost. And by the time I got to Dallas Seminary, he was in his 90s. <clears throat> approaching 100, I believe he is close to 100 now. We used to joke and say the reason he's called Dr. Pentecost is because he was actually there, you know, on the (laughs) day of Pentecost. But he took a particular interest in me, and he spent a lot of time with me, both in the classroom and in private, inculcating into me his beliefs that he felt the Lord had taught him. And finally, I I asked him, I said, why is it that you are spending all of this extra time with me? And his answer was very simple. He says, I can multiply my ministry through you. 
In other words, the things that the Lord has taught me, I can instill them into you, and you can teach them to people that I will have absolutely no contact with. And in fact, he said, as you look across the continents of the world, what you will discover is the theology that I have inculcated into my students, teaching at this school for about 50 years, is all over in every major continent of the world. And that's what kept Dr. Pentecost motivated teaching at such an old age, inculcating beliefs and biblical truths, the things that the Lord had showed him, into the lives of young people because he understood the principles of spiritual multiplication. So try that this year. Ask the Lord to bring someone or perhaps two people into your life that you can lead to Christ and disciple. And then pray that the Lord will do the same thing in their lives. And we can watch the gospel just take off across the world. And so Philip finds Nathanael. And notice, if you will, the second part of verse 45. And he said to him, that's Philip speaking to Nathanael, we have found him whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote. Jesus Christ was the only man that has ever entered into world history whose birth, death, number of pieces of silver he would be betrayed for, manner of death, manner of birth, life, was revealed in a script hundreds and thousands of years before it actually transpired. There are many people today that claim that they are God. We even have a politician or two sometimes claiming a divine mantle upon themselves. But anybody who claims to be God has got to equal the record of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is different than any other charlatan or huckster claiming to be God because Jesus Christ fulfilled a script that was preordained and prewritten hundreds and in some instances thousands of years before Jesus ever showed up. We call that the Old Testament. And as the gospel now is being shared with from Philip to Nathaniel, there is a reference to this. We have found him whom... Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote. It doesn't tell us what verses were in the mind of uh, Philip as he is sharing with Nathaniel. Maybe it was Genesis 3 verse 15, which predicts there would be a descendant who would come from the woman who would crush the serpent's head. Maybe in his mind was Isaiah 53 and verse 5, which indicates that the Messiah would be pierced. Maybe in his mind was Daniel 9 and verse 26, which predicts that the Messiah would be cut off. Maybe in his mind was Micah 5 and verse 2, which indicates Jesus would be born in Bethlehem. Maybe in his mind was Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9, which indicates that Christ would ride into Jerusalem on a donkey. We don't know what verses were in his mind. But as a Jew, he had a devout understanding of the Old Testament. And he's saying this man Jesus Christ is the guy. Dr. Tim LaHaye, in one of his books on Bible prophecy, identifies 109 prophecies that were fulfilled in the first coming of Jesus Christ. Prophecies that were written hundreds and thousands of years in advance. In fact, there is a statistician named Peter Stoner who has looked into this, and he was an expert in probabilities. And he tried to determine what probabilistically, if that's a word, what uh, what's the probability of these prophecies coming true in one human being? Let's just pick eight prophecies. And he did the calculation. And he came up with a number that has so many zeros after it, we can't even comprehend what he was talking about. So he says, okay, let me give you an illustration. Suppose you take the state of Texas and you fill it with silver dollars about two feet deep all over this state. And you were to mark one silver dollar with a red X or some sort of marker and you were to just randomly throw it into the pile somewhere in the state. And then you were to blindfold a man 
and say to that man, go ahead and stumble through these silver dollar bills, silver dollars, I should say, all over this state. And when you're ready, just randomly reach down into the ground and pull up a silver dollar. And if this man who was blindfolded randomly reached into the ground, pulled up, pulled up a silver dollar, and that happened to be the only marked one, think how improbable that is. And Peter Stoner says that is how improbable it is for simply eight prophecies to be fulfilled in the life of Jesus Christ, let alone the hundred and nine. And Jesus uses this constantly to show people who he is. In Luke chapter 24 and verse 44, it says, Now he said to them, These are my words which I spoke to you while I was with you, that all things written about me in the law of Moses, in the prophets, and in the Psalms might be fulfilled. In Luke 24, 27, it says this, Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in the Scriptures. John 5 and verse 39, You search the Scripture because you think in them you have eternal life, but these are the words which testify about me. John 5 and verse 46, For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. What an amazing, unique man this individual Jesus Christ is. Coming forward and fulfilling a script written about him hundreds and thousands of years in advance. And notice what he continues to unfold there in verse 45. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom, the, of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. In John chapter 1 and verse 14, a verse we studied some time back, we read these words. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. In the incarnation of Jesus Christ, humanity was added alongside eternally existent deity. Jesus was not just God, but He was man. He was not just man, He was God. He was the unique God-man. And here uh, we have some references to his manhood, that he was a member of the human race. For one thing, he was from a place called Nazareth, born in Bethlehem, which is not too far from Jerusalem, but spent his years growing up in a place called Nazareth. He was the son of Joseph. Now, because of the virgin birth, he was uh, Joseph was not Christ's biological father, but from a human perspective, Christ was associated with that lineage. So just as you had a specific place in the country or the world that you grew up, so did Jesus Christ. Just as you have a genealogy, Jesus Christ has a genealogy as well. And watch the reaction of Nathaniel to this genealogical and geographical truth. Notice, if you will, verse 46. Nathanael said to him, that would be Philip, Nathanael said to him, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Are you telling me that this man Jesus Christ, in whom you're bragging on, the one who has fulfilled all of the Old Testament, are you telling me he grew up in Nazareth? Because Nazareth in that time was a city of very little significance. And Philip, excuse me, Nathaniel, did not understand the divine program. He thought a king would come into the world with some sort of glorious entrance, the way kings do. But that's not how God works. In God and in his timing and in his prerogative, the cross precedes the crown. The sorrows precede him one day at his second coming, ruling and reigning. And here uh, Nathaniel is just thinking like an ordinary person. He's not thinking the way God thinks. 
He is thinking about the fact that if this man, Jesus Christ, is the king, there should be some sort of grand city and there should be some sort of grand entrance. And yet God will not condescend to human expectations. God is going to run his program his way, whether it meets human expectations or not. In Matthew chapter 2 and verse 23, we read these words. And he came and lived in a city called Nazareth. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophets, plural. He shall be called a Nazarene. Now, I will pay anybody a hundred dollars if they can locate that verse in the Old Testament. Where do we find the verse in the Old Testament that is quoted here? He shall be called a Nazarene. Well, the reason I offered you a hundred dollars is because the verse is not in the Old Testament. You think I'd give you a hundred dollars based on what they pay me around here? I'd go broke. (laughs) That's a joke. Actually, I'm paid pretty well, but anyway. At least give me the the wage of a stand-up comic or something. Um, He shall be called a Nazarene. Now, you notice the word prophets. He is not citing a verse. Prophets is, is plural. He is citing a theme. There is no verse that says that, but there is a broad theme that he shall be called a Nazarene. Nazareth was a city of insignificance, and so what we learn from the Old Testament is that Jesus Christ would come into this world in a very insignificant way. He would be a man of grief, a man of sorrows. He would not come into the world to rule and to reign and to judge the way you think a king would come. Now, all of that will be fulfilled at his second coming, but not his first coming. Isaiah 53 and verse 3 says he was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised and we did not esteem him. Psalm 22 and verse 6 says, but I am a worm and not a man, a reproach of men and despised by people. Now, when you think about this, this is one of the great proofs we have that the Bible is really and truly from God. If a human being were to write this book, we would have some sort of grand entrance into the world. I mean, if I was the author of the Bible, I would at least make him born in New York or Washington, D.C., Jerusalem, but certainly not Nazareth. And yet, because the Bible originated from the divine mind and not the human mind, and because God does not condescend to human expectations and runs his program his way and not man's way, Jesus has an insignificant beginning from the human perspective. A indirect proof that this book is truly from God. Now, Philip makes this statement. Excuse me, Nathaniel makes this statement, and notice Philip's response. Nathaniel said to him, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, come and see. Now, this is, in my mind, a pretty good evangelistic strategy. Because what happens with people is they want all of their questions answered when you evangelize them. I was sitting uh, there in Starbucks yesterday, completely minding my own business actually preparing for the sermon. And some guy walks in and he says, you look pretty thoughtful over there. And I said, yeah, what are you doing? And I told him what I was doing. And he says, do you believe God sends people to hell? Do you believe in hell? Just out of the clear blue. And I said, yes, I do. And he wanted to get into this big philosophical discussion about why would God allow hell? And I said, I believe in hell because it's in the Bible. And he tried to bring up another philosophical point. I said, it's in the Bible. And then he said, well, who wrote the Bible? I said, God wrote the Bible. Ultimately, he used men. And so this fellow could uh, only get so far with me in terms of his philosophical objections. I just kept pointing him back to the Bible. And generally, that's what you need to do with people. Don't get into these long-winded conversations with people because what they really need is an encounter with God. If that man at Starbucks yesterday had had an encounter with God, all of these silly questions in his mind would disappear in a nanosecond. And so what you see here is Philip 
not getting into this long discussion about Nazareth. He simply says, come and see. This reminds me of the story of the missionary who was trying to lead an individual to Christ. And this individual says, I will come and believe in your Jesus if you can answer ten questions. And the missionary looks at his watch and says, I actually have an appointment, but I'll tell you what, I will come back tomorrow and answer your ten questions if you trust Christ now. And the man says, okay. So he became a Christian, and the missionary made good on his promise, and he came back the next day, and he said, I'm ready now to answer your ten questions. And the man said, I don't have those questions anymore. Because what had happened to him is something greater than himself had entered him, called the Holy Spirit, and had begun to enlighten and illuminate his mind to spiritual things. And isn't it interesting how God has a way to answer all of our so-called objections, things we think are objections that really are no objections at all. Philip does not get into a debate about Nazareth. He simply says, come and see. And in fact, later on in the chapter, verse 49, we're going to see that Nathanael got light. Because later on, he's going to identify Christ as the Son of God and the King of Israel. And now we move from that section to part three of this, for we have a miracle is performed by Jesus Christ for this man, Nathanael. This is, as Philip is bringing Nathanael to Christ, this is the first miracle that we have in all of John's Gospel. John's Gospel is going to focus around seven signs that begin in chapter 2. The first sign, the water to wine at Cana, we'll look at next time. So that's when the signs begin. In fact, uh, in John chapter 2 and verse 11, after Jesus performs that miracle, it says this is the beginning of his signs that Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory. What we have here in chapter 1 is sort of a mini sign. It's sort of a, a prequel and the sequel will begin in chapter 2. It's sort of a sign before the signs. It's sort of a foretaste of greater things to come. And notice what happens there in verse 47. As Philip is bringing Nathanael to Jesus, Jesus saw Nathanael coming and said to him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit or there is no guile. What is the sign that Jesus performed? Jesus, as omniscient God, has the ability to discern the motives of the human heart. As you sit here this morning, you really don't know what my motives are. And I don't know what yours are. You guys look so spiritual out there holding your Bibles and singing. I would think your motives are very good, but I don't know. But God knows. And in John 2, verse 25, it says, And because he did not need anyone to testify concerning him, for he himself knew what was in man. Jesus, through omniscience, can look into the human heart and weigh the motivation of a human being. That is what is going to happen at the end of John 2. That is what is happening right now as Jesus is looking into the heart of this man, Nathaniel, and, and seeing what his motive truly is. So Jesus says, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no Deceit. Now, this word Israelite comes from the word Israel. The word Israel ultimately comes from the word Jacob. Jacob's name in Genesis chapter 31 was changed to Israel. Do you know what Jacob's name means? The name simply means deceiver. Genesis uh, 27 verses 35 and 30. Six. So what is happening is that an Israelite, whose name means deceiver, is coming to Christ with pure 
motives. And by the time of Christ, the nation of Israel had essentially imitated the character of their forebearer, Jacob. It was a nation that was awash in trickery and deception. This is the nation that will formally turn Christ over to Rome for crucifixion. And yet from this large group comes a Jew whose motives are right and whose motives are pure. He is not going to be like the majority who are going to continue in their trickery and deceit and scheming and ultimately reject Jesus Christ. But here is coming somebody whose motives are pure. Here is somebody that is abnormal, in other words. Here is somebody that is going against the grain. Here is somebody that is not following the majority, but is following the minority. And all the way through John chapter 1, starting in chapter 1, going all the way through verse 11, that is what is happening. People are turning their back on Jesus Christ right and left, but not everyone. There's a smaller handful, a group that we call the remnant, who is coming to Jesus Christ with pure motives. And of course, we have to ask ourselves the question, when we believe in Jesus Christ, what really are our motives? Are we following the majority or are we coming to him with pure motives the way the minority was doing. And so Jesus could look into this man's heart and discern this and ascertain this. Man can't do this. Only God who is omniscient can do it. And look at the shock on Nathaniel. It says, Nathaniel said to him, how do you know me? I mean, it's a shocking thing. If somebody can look directly into your heart and see exactly what is going on inside of it. How do you know me? And notice Christ's Response, Jesus answered and said to him, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Now, this reference to the fig tree, many people take it as a literal fig tree. And that is a very legitimate interpretation. But what you'll discover in the Bible is a fig tree typically is used as a figure of speech of one's habitation. It's a place of peaceful habitation. When you were resting safely and securely in your own home, you were said to be sitting under your own fig tree. Many references to this, but 1 Kings 4 and verse 25 says, So Judah and Israel lived in safety, every man under his vine and his fig tree, from Dan to Beersheba all the days of Solomon. So it's most likely that Jesus saw Nathanael in Nathanael's house before Philip brought Nathanael to Jesus Christ. So Jesus could look at Nathanael and not only see what was going on in his heart, but he could see what was happening in his life even before Jesus at a a human level encountered Nathaniel. And so what you see emerging here is the God man has a capacity for knowing all things. He is omniscient. And this is an attribute of God that continues to be highlighted all the way through John's gospel. It's going to happen in John 4 with the woman at the well. The woman, John 4, verse 17, it says this, the woman answered and said, I have no husband. Now, Jesus is leading a very what we would call from the human level, a very loose, uh, adulterous woman, a woman involved in fornication. He's leading this woman to himself. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you have correctly said, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands. And the one whom you now have is not your husband. This You have said truly. The woman said to him, Sir, I love this answer, I perceive you're a prophet. Good guess. He's actually a lot higher than a prophet, as she will discover. And as this woman goes out now as a new believer and begins to bring others to Christ, this is the attribute that she highlights. In John 4, verse 29, she says, Come, see a man who told me all things that I have done. This is not the Christ, is it? 
And so the same type of thing is coming into the life of Nathaniel. It is blowing the mind of Nathaniel that somebody can read his motives, number one, and somebody can see him in his house a great distance away through omniscience before there is any human contact. And guess what happens to Nathaniel, the one that had all of these questions about Nazareth, as he encounters these signs performed by the God-man. Notice what happens to Nathaniel. Look, if you will, at verse 49. Nathaniel answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. On account of this miracle, Nathaniel calls Jesus Rabbi. Now, Jesus earlier in this chapter has been called Rabbi, verse 38. Then he calls him the Son of God. Jesus earlier in this chapter has been called the Son of God, verse 34. And what you are seeing is John is using this event as the Spirit of God is leading him in composing his gospel to highlight these facts. Because John tells us that Jesus performed signs for the purpose of convincing people that he is the Son of God. This whole conversation goes directly into John's purpose in writing. And Nathaniel just keeps on going. With these phrases and terms, he moves from rabbi to the son of God, verse 49, and then he calls him the king of Israel. An Israelite calling Jesus the king of Israel, he recognizes that Jesus is Israel's political and spiritual redeemer. The guy with the questions about how can anything good come from Nazareth, Philip just leads Nathaniel to Christ, and the light is going on in Nathaniel's mind as these various signs related to omniscience are happening, and Nathaniel is getting it right. He is being convinced of who Christ is in terms of his proper identity because of these signs. And then we move to part four of this, verses 50 and 51, where we have a promise of greater things to come. And notice what Jesus says in verse 50. Jesus answered and said to him, because I said to you that I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. Now, notice the word believe, the B word, a word that is used roughly in verbal form about a hundred times in this gospel. Nathaniel is now in faith. He believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God on account of these signs. John told us that would happen. Therefore, many other signs Jesus performed in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these, a smaller subsection, have been written so that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. John wants the reader to come to the same conclusion that Nathaniel came to. You read this book and you say, no human being could have done these things. This man, Jesus Christ, must be the Son of God, the Christ, and believe in him and consequently experience the gift of life. Nathaniel's faith becomes, if you will, a prototype of what John once replicated in all of his audience and in all of his Readers, And yet Jesus is sort of surprised at Nathaniel. Because I said to you that I saw you under the fig tree, you believe? Question mark. In other words, Nathaniel, um, it's fantastic that you believe on me. But what you have seen is really small potatoes. I mean, if that little evidence brings you to faith, praise the Lord. But, you know, Nathaniel, you need to stick around. Because you ain't seen nothing yet. And in fact, John's gospel will reveal the greater things through the seven signs beginning next week with the water to wine at Cana, climaxing in Jesus bringing back someone from the dead in John 11. Major, major signs in comparison to the 
small potatoes that Nathaniel has just seen. The faith that exists in Nathaniel as Jesus throughout this book performs sign after sign after sign will become strengthened. Faith is in existence. Faith is real. But now it's about to receive additional confirmation over and over and over again. Well, what greater things are on the horizon? Jesus says, I'm glad you asked that question. Notice, if you will, verse 41. Verse 50, he said, you'll see greater things. What are those greater things? They're answered in verse 51. He said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see the heavens opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Verse 51. Notice this expression, truly, truly, I say to you. That is an expression, uh, and or roughly its equivalent, that happens about 25 times in this book. Whenever Jesus says, truly, truly, I say unto you, something big in terms of a disclosure is about to happen. In other words, this is important information that is coming. Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see the heavens opened. Now, in the the verb you will see is not singular, but it's plural. In other words, Jesus is making a statement not to just, not just to Nathaniel, Nathaniel, but to all of those that are attracted to Jesus Christ because of this Miracle. Greater things are on the horizon, not just for Nathaniel, but for the entire remnant. Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see the heavens opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Of course, the background for all of this is Jacob's dream. You'll recall all the way back in the book of Genesis in a place called Bethel, Jacob had a dream. And in the dream, he saw a ladder and the ladder connected earth to heaven. And Jacob in this dream saw angels going up the ladder and coming down the ladder. You'll notice this expression, the heavens will be opened. And what Jesus is saying is insight that people on the earth are going to receive because of what God is doing in heaven. What is God doing in heaven? What is heaven like? How can that question be answered unless we have an inhabitant from heaven who has come to the earth to dwell amongst men? Angels in the Old Testament are typically messengers. And what is being said here is that this God-man that has come into your world is going to reveal to you heaven realities. Things that you can't contemplate on your own. Things that you can't philosophize into existence through human flesh or human power. These things are going to become a reality into your life because an inhabitant from heaven is here, the God-man. Jesus is going to reveal heavenly things to this remnant. And this is a massive, massive theme in God, uh, John's gospel. Heavenly reality coming to man. You'll notice also there in verse 51 that Jesus refers to himself for the very first time as the son of man. The son of man is a very important term. It goes directly back to Daniel 7 and verse 13 where the Messiah, the conquering king at the second coming, who will overthrow the Antichrist and his system of government, is called the Son of Man. You see, title after title is being ascribed to Jesus Christ here. And John, as he is writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is documenting all of these things so that people can know exactly who Jesus Christ is. This ladder that connects Heaven to earth. What does a ladder do? A ladder connects two different destinations. A ladder 
uh, makes traveling from one destination to another, from the ground, for example, to the roof of your home, a possibility. And what are the two destinations that this ladder bridges? We have God on one end of the stick and we have man on the other end of the stick. How can that chasm be bridged? How do you bridge a chasm between God and man? Answer, you have the God man. Someone who is 100% man and can identify with man and someone who is 100% God and who can identify with God. Only the God man can be that ladder connecting these infinitely removed destinations between God and man. This was Job's concern all the way back in the book of Job. Chapter 9 and verses 32 and 33, it says, "For Now remember, Job had all his problems. And Job says, For he, that's God, is not a man that I may answer him, that we may go to court together. There is no umpire between us who may lay his hand upon us both. Job, you remember from the book of Job, says to God, I've got a lot of problems, God. And I don't know why these problems have come into my life. And I want to get into heaven, God, and explain my case to you. But the problem is I have no advocate. I have no umpire. I have no one who could lay his hands on both of us and get you, God, to understand me. And God, that advocate, would also help me understand you. Job 9, verses 32 through 33, therefore becomes the great question of the Bible. Where is this advocate that can connect God and man? And we have an answer in this man, Jesus Christ, the God-man. He is that ladder that can connect earth to heaven and heaven to earth. He is the ladder by which we, as mere earth dwellers and human beings, can grasp and understand Heavenly reality. And this is why over and over again, Jesus is called the advocate. He is called the intermediary. John 14 and verse 6, Jesus said to him, I am the, notice the definite article, the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Acts 4.12, there is salvation in no one else For there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. 1 Timothy 2.5 For there is one God and one mediator also between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. One of the things that sort of gets under my skin is people today arguing that there are many paths. There aren't many paths because there is only one God, man. And so Jesus reveals himself as this ladder. And I hope what you're catching here at the conclusion of this passage is all of the different ways that John has identified Jesus Christ. One of John's purposes in writing is to point out who Christ is. And look at all of the ways John has done this in chapter 1. He's called the light, the only begotten of the Father, the Christ, the only begotten of God, the Lord, the Lamb, a man, the Son of God, Rabbi, Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of Joseph, the Son of God, the King of Israel, and the Son of Man. John is leaving very little doubts in our minds as we're studying his gospel as to the proper identity of Jesus Christ. And so what we've seen uh, this morning are four things. Philip becomes a believer, verses 43 and 44. An invitation goes out to Nathaniel, verses 45 and 46. A miracle has been done for Nathaniel through omniscience, verses 47 through 49. And then there's a promise of greater things to come. Shall we pray? Father, we remain grateful for the gospel record. We remain grateful for not allowing us to grope and stumble about in darkness as to spiritual things. But you have clearly revealed to us who this man, Jesus Christ, is. We thank you for that great work. 
And we ask, Lord, this morning that many, many people would come to believe in him. Well, this weekend, I hope it didn't come across in my preaching, I've been an emotional basket case. And uh, now some of you are saying, well, what else is new? But there's just a couple of things that have happened uh, in this church um, Friday and Saturday, which are very clear reminders, at least to me and I'm sure to you, that this life, as James tells us, is like mist that appears for a little while and then it's gone. You all heard in the prayer request what happened to Nathaniel. Many of you were here yesterday where we had the uh, memorial service for John or Johnny, as he liked to be called, Johnny Linscombe. And those two events back to back are just a reminder to us that, you know, we think we have a lot of time left, but you never know, as the saying goes, when your number's up. Many people say, well, I'm going to postpone believing in Jesus Christ for next month or next year or tomorrow. And the fact of the matter is you don't even know if you're going to have it tomorrow. The Bible teaches very clearly that today is the day of salvation. Hearing what we have studied this morning, you know who the identity of Jesus Christ is. Why in the world would you postpone a decision for Christ? Why would you say, well, I'll handle that tomorrow or next month or next year in his offer of salvation, which is available. You're not going to get a better deal than this. And so if you're here this morning sort of struggling with whether you're a Christian or not, why not just put the issue to rest and solve it once and for all? Jesus Christ stepped out of eternity into time to live a life in my place that I couldn't live, to pay a penalty for my sin that I can't pay. And he resurrected from the dead, which validates exactly who he is and who he claimed to be, the unique God-man. And he offers humanity a simple promise. If you believe, which is a synonym for trust, a synonym for rely, a synonym for depend, a synonym for have confidence in, if you simply rest or trust or believe in what I have done for you, then your sins are thrown as far as the east is from the west. The Holy Spirit will come into you. You are given the gift of life. Your destination in heaven is sealed and secure and nobody can take it away. I can't think of a better deal in the universe going. And so go ahead, even in the quietness of your own thoughts and minds, as the Holy Spirit perhaps is convicting some of you of the sin of unbelief, just go ahead in the privacy of your own thoughts and heart. Trust in what Jesus has done the best you know how to do it. And if that is something that you're doing on the authority of the Word of God, you have become a child of God. And if it's something that you need some more information on, Uh, I'm available after the service to dock. Anybody up here on the worship team is available after the service to talk. Life is short. We don't know when our number is up. And so let's trust in Jesus today because today is the day of salvation. Now the God of peace who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Jesus our Lord, equip you in every good thing to do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed.